Over the past while, I've been trying to learn as much as I can about cryptocurrencies. A few months ago, I started posting videos sharing my explorations into Bitcoin and Ethereum. Since then, Ethereum has increased in value by over 400%. Bitcoin has increased by over 80%. This was over the span of just four months. Now, obviously I can't really take credit for having great timing when I happened to post those videos or about when I happened to actually explore those topics and invest in those particular assets, I kind of chalk that up to just good luck. A lot of the time when an investor experiences a return like this, especially in a short period of time, they're usually tempted to sell. But I'm not going to be selling my Bitcoin or my Ethereum. And today I wanna to share with you my thought process when it comes to making that decision so that you can make your own decision. The key word here being own decision. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Instead, I want you to think critically and come to your own conclusion. Okay, so Steve from the future here to interrupt this video because while I was editing it, of course, as some of you will already know, Elon Musk decided to basically cancel Bitcoin payments for Tesla. And on top of that, it looks like there's been some developments with um, Dogecoin, I guess. Um, I'm not sure if he's just trolling about that or if that's real, but he also uh, ended up talking about Bitcoin's um, energy usage and stuff like that and kind of re-sparked that conversation again. So as it still stands, I am not selling my Bitcoin or my Ethereum and all the points in this video still stand for me, but I will be including an additional part at the end of this video where I will share my thoughts on those developments that just happened with Bitcoin's energy usage and um, Musk's tweets. The first reason I'm not selling my Bitcoin or my Ethereum is for self-defense purposes. Sorry, I don't mean that type of self-defense, but man, I am just itching to get back into Muay Thai. This, this lockdown can't end soon enough. What I'm talking about is a different form of self-defense, financial self-defense. Today, there's so much talk about how our financial system is problematic. With all of this government stimulus and sky-high federal debt levels, many people are concerned for their financial futures. Will we see inflation, deflation, interest rates go up, interest rates go negative, a stock market crash, or a revival of the bull market due to technological innovation. There's so many intelligent people debating all the different facets of this discussion that it makes it both interesting and confusing to dive into. There's compelling arguments all across the spectrum. From a crypto-based macroeconomic perspective, I've been exploring the work of Robert Breedlove, Lynn Alden, Nick Carter, Balaji, and Alan Farrington recently. I listened to an episode of the Tim Ferriss show with Balaji on it, and he talked about this concept that he called self-defense. Yep. Well, let's first talk to any particular strategies or tactics for self -defense. defending oneself. Exactly, for self-defense. Do you have any thoughts there? I believe part of the point that he was trying to make is that it's important to manage our finances in such a way that it protects us from things that are outside of our control. We personally can't control whether our economy booms or whether it busts, whether the stock market crashes or whether it goes up. But what we can do is to make sure that we have at least some of our money in assets that act as a store of value, no matter the economic circumstances. And so that is what he and many other people believe Bitcoin in particular is. And every day that goes by, I more and more tend to agree. In part one of Alan Farrington's Bitcoin serialization series, which I greatly enjoyed reading, he starts with a story about Ludwig Wittgenstein, or Steen, I'm not sure, a philosopher and professor at Cambridge in the 20th century. Tell me, why do people say it is more natural to think that the sun rotates around the earth than that the earth is rotating? The friend said, well, obviously, because it just seems like the sun is going around the earth. Wittgenstein replied, well, what would it seem like if it did seem like 
the earth were rotating. Then he ends part one by tying in the story with this mic drop moment. What would it seem like if it did seem like a global digital sound open programmable money was monetizing from absolute zero? The second reason I'm not selling my Bitcoin or my Ethereum is because of the network effects both of these platforms have. Network effects is the concept that each new person or entity who participates in the network strengthens it by orders of magnitude. In other words, the more people or businesses who hold cryptocurrency or use it in some manner, the stronger the whole platform becomes and the harder it is to stop. In the first four months of this year alone, we've seen an incredible amount of people, businesses, investment firms start embracing blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. With Ethereum in particular, we've seen billions of dollars worth of applications be built onto that blockchain with one of the most notable examples being DeFi. But Ethereum isn't the only blockchain that's created innovations in this way. There's a lot of really interesting things going on with the uses for Bitcoin as well. One of the most notable is a high interest savings account for Bitcoin. And when I say high interest, I mean like high interest. I'm talking like over 6%. Initially, I I was very skeptical of these types of high interest savings account because a 6% interest rate is, like I said, insanely high. And the only way that a company could possibly pay you that is if they're loaning out your cryptocurrency at a higher rate than this, which seems incredibly risky to me. But I actually had the opportunity to speak directly to the founders of one of the companies offering these types of savings accounts. And that company is Ledin. And as I was speaking with them, not only were they able to put my concerns at ease, but we also realized that we share a common goal. And so we decided to team up for this video. Like me, Ledin is on a mission to effect a positive change in the financial world. Their mission is to bank the un banked. And the way that they're doing this is by building out financial services for the world of cryptocurrency. So after speaking with the guys at Ledin, I decided to open up a high interest savings account where I'll be getting 6.1% interest on my Bitcoin. If you're anything like me, then you're probably hyper concerned about the safety of your cryptocurrencies. One of the things that helped put me at ease was the fact that Ledin is the first digital asset lending company with a proof of reserves attestation, meaning that you yourself can actually verify that your coins are being held where they should be. But perhaps the most impactful thing for me was that when I was speaking to the co-founders of Ledin, one of them said to me that, you know, there may be bigger and more well-known companies in this space than us, but we really want to do things the right way. And if that means we have to grow a little bit slower, we're okay with that. That really resonated with me because that describes exactly how I approach the work that I do. So if you're interested in giving Lead in a shot, you can find them in the description linked down below. The third reason I'm not selling my Bitcoin or my Ethereum is because of what Raul Pal refers to as the super massive black hole. This is not a literal black hole in space. This is a figure of speech basically describing the fact that the cryptocurrency space is sucking in all the best talent in the world. Whether we're talking about investors, programmers, scientists, economists, philosophers, and everyone in between, so many people are now turning their attention to this new digital frontier. This is one of the main reasons that I began seriously investing cryptocurrency because for many years, I thought it was just this silly internet money. But once I started reading and listening to the people who actually do work in this space, I not only realized that this was an area worthy of serious consideration, but the amount of just raw intellectual power in this place is mind blowing. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen such a diverse group of people with such different skill sets come together to work on the same project. So that's why I think this is really the beginning of something that 
we right now can't fully comprehend. All I know is that it resonates so strongly with me that it's just something I really want to be a part of. If you've checked out Robert Breedlove's work, then you know that investigating Bitcoin means asking the question, what is money? And when you ask that question, you realize that you've actually asked a million questions at once. But if you were to ask the question, what is Bitcoin? Well, as Alan Farrington wrote, what would it seem like if it did seem like a global, digital, sound, open, programmable money was monetizing from absolute zero? Okay, so let's talk about what Elon Musk said and about the Bitcoin energy usage conversation. So first of all, this definitely surprised me that he said that because only a short while ago, Jack Dorsey tweeted um, something along the lines of basically saying that Bitcoin incentivizes the use of clean energy. And then Elon Musk replied to that tweet by saying, true. So this is quite the flip flop from agreeing with Jack on that point to now being very concerned about Bitcoin's energy usage. So this is a very tricky subject to navigate and I'm still forming my own opinion on it and trying to do as much research as I possibly can. But from what I've understood so far, the debate isn't that whether or not Bitcoin uses a lot of energy, it most certainly does use a lot of energy. The debate is more about two points. The first of those points being, does Bitcoin have any claim on the Earth's resources whatsoever? And B, what is the actual energy mix being used? Are we talking about clean energy usage or are we talking about dirty energy usage? One of the first points that I think is really important to consider is that when you're comparing payment systems against each other, so if we're comparing Bitcoin to the current financial system, sometimes you'll see articles compare Bitcoin to Visa. But that's not really a good comparison because Bitcoin and Visa are two very different things. In our financial system, there's different layers to every transaction that actually takes place. So when we're talking about Visa, if, you're, if you went to a store and you used your credit card, that transaction is actually not final. And what I mean by that is, there's all these different layers that happen in, in our financial system where that transaction does not actually settle right away. Instead, there's a deeper layer of the financial system that then aggregates all the visa transactions and then settles them between essentially banks. So when you do buy something with uh, your credit card, that's not a financial that's not a final transaction in the way that it's not a similar transaction to the way that Bitcoin transactions are similar. Visa could be said to be a level two, three, or maybe even four financial system, whereas Bitcoin is a level one financial system. Bitcoin isn't meant to be doing the volume of transactions that Visa is. Instead, the plan is to build on top of Bitcoin, to build level two and maybe three transaction systems that can handle a much larger volume of transactions in the same way that Visa is handled. And then what will happen is all those transactions on the level and two and three layer will be aggregated and then those transactions will be settled on the Bitcoin layer. So when it does scale up, those transactions will not use anywhere near the same amount of energy as one Bitcoin transaction currently does. So comparing Visa to Bitcoin doesn't really make sense. You'd wanna look at things like the, the Lightning Network and what the Lightning Network evolves to be and what other applications built on top of Bitcoin evolved to be. As for the energy mix of Bitcoin, we can rely on estimates at this stage. We can't rely on exact data, but the estimates are saying that there's between 39% to 74% of all Bitcoin mining is done using renewable energy. So that's a pretty wide range, but there are some other important points to consider. For example, 
When people look at Bitcoin mining, they sometimes say, well, the majority of it is currently done in China. And if we look at China's CO2 footprint based on their energy mix, which a lot of it comes from coal, well, that's not a very good CO2 footprint. But it might be a mistake to map China's generic footprint to the usage of or to Bitcoin mining because the energy mix of Bitcoin mining might be very different from the generic energy mix of China itself. For example, there's a region in China called Sichuan where a large amount of Bitcoin mining takes place. And in that particular region, there's an overbuild of hydroelectric dams, which means there's this oversupply of renewable energy that would otherwise go to waste. But Bitcoin miners have figured out that they can set up shop there basically, and then have access to this nearly free energy that would otherwise go to waste that is clean energy. So that's some of the ways that Bitcoin mining may actually incentivize clean energy usage, especially clean energy usage that might otherwise be wasted. I would really recommend reading Nick Carter's work on this as he has written exhaustively about it. And finally, the last point I would maybe bring up is this isn't necessarily directly related to energy per se, but I think it is important to consider that those of us who live in the West, we get to transact in the world's reserve currency in dollars. And this puts the West in a position of power that a lot of developing nations do not have. And so I recently read this really good article um, basically discussing what they called fiat privilege where we don't realize or we, we might not realize all of the benefits of Bitcoin on a global scale because we transact in dollars, whereas many developing nations have monetary problems. They have problems with their currencies and their financial systems that Bitcoin is actually solving. So I will include a link to that article as I think it is a good read to get a global perspective on how Bitcoin can affect the lives of people in other countries than just the West. As I said, I'm still of course forming my own opinion when it comes to the Bitcoin energy debate but I hope that some of the points that I kind of brought up today were helpful for you if you're also trying to form your own opinion. And I hope you enjoyed this video overall. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.